with these weirdos keep jumping in with their tally whackers, I'm not going to put it on YouTube. I'll just upload it later. Or I might not upload it at all. But I had an idea about this thing with Balder. And um, I was listening to some stuff by Young on archetypes. And then, and then I was listening to um, Raghunath Kapo on Joe Rogan. And he said some interesting things too. He said some interesting things about the ego. And he said, said something that really caught my mind about uh, you're not a body that has a soul. You're a soul that has a body. And it spoke to the cyclical existence of everything we did. And he said, all these different layers of existence, you pass through them. You know, they sell the idea that, that the afterlife is an eternal thing, either in a bad place or a good place, which has been the predominant thought process for 2000 years. But he, he suggested that in the Hindu kind of mentality, you pass through that just like you pass through this life. And um, then I heard Jordan Peterson talking about incorporating the logos. And all of it lent itself to a, uh, a fairly uh, neat idea about Balder that I uh, want to discuss tonight. I'm going to read the lore a little bit so we get so we're all on the same sheet of music. <laughs> it said, um, "Now shall be told of tidings which seemed of more consequence to the Aesir. The beginning of the story is this: that Balder the Good dreamed great and perilous dreams touching his life, and that lends itself back to the Groa Galder, where Svipdag approaches the mound that his mother Groa is in, and he is." a young man, but he is fixing to make this transition to adulthood and go find his partner and go begin the journey to become associated with Mingloth, the necklace clad, the woman that he is destined to be with. And he says that he is in fear of his life because he has been challenged by his stepmother to go do this thing. And this is a, a common thing among young men. When the enemy is always perceived as being outside of oneself, instead of the real battle that resides in here. There's a real fear of what do I become if I have to undertake this journey? And there's a hint of that here with Balder making the transition from the young, adventuresome young man to a full-on adult. So Frigga, as his mother, anyway, when the, he told these dreams to the Aesir, they took counsel together, and this was their decision, to ask safety for Balder from all kinds of dangers. Now, this kind of insulation removes the challenges from an individual's lives. And all of these challenges that we face, be they of our own making or if they are legitimate challenges of the world, whether natural disaster, war, so on and so forth, they're there for a reason. They're there for us to grow, to deal with death, loss of a loved one. All of these things are part of our existence and becoming more. And this deity, while all of the other deities in the lore have a set of challenges or multiple challenges that they must deal with, we have one deity who is spared that difficulty in Balder. So Frigga took oaths to this purport that fire and water should spare Balder, likewise iron and metal of all kinds, stones, earth, trees, sicknesses, beasts, birds, venom, serpents. And when that was done and made known, then it was a diversion of Balder's and the Aesir that they should stand up at the thing and all the others should come, sh should some shoot at him, some hew at him, some beat him with stones. But whatsoever was done hurt him not at all. And that seemed to them all a very worshipful thing. So he is spared the difficulties of growth. And the first thing he does is abuse it with the assistance of those around him. And they called it a worshipful thing. He is born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He is given the privilege of being spared the rigors of growth and then abuses the privilege. And we don't really ever talk about that because, well, he's, he's the golden child. But you cannot put off the aspects of growth necessary for an individual to endure and still become what you're supposed to become. And this is usually a sticking point for many people when they begin to consider, well, the Lord is too heavily Christianized. This tale of a deity dying and being reborn has been told 16 times that I personally know of throughout mythologies around the world. 
there's an idea here, a much deeper idea that is very valuable, especially for this Western civilization. <coughs> and Loki plays an important part of it. Now, I've always pointed out that Loki represents the ego, the guy who is unwilling or unable to measure up to the privilege to which he is born. And yet here's one who, Balder is also unable or unwilling to measure up to the level to which he was born, to justify his seat at the table. And we never talk about that. Instead of being like Tyr, facing his father to gain his heritage of a mile wide cauldron, instead of Freya who goes searching for love, instead of Odin who sacrifices himself to himself, instead of following even his own father's example, he does the same thing Loki does and avoids justifying his ability to grow and become something more. And this is a big failure, but you can't put it off. <coughs> when Loki Laufersen saw this, it pleased him ill that Balder took no hurt. Well, if you're the quarterback walking down the hall on Monday morning after a big win on Friday night, and all you did was throw the ball on these running backs, you're getting all the glory and the pats on the back, and all the girls are wooing, ooing, and on at you, and you're a big, dumb, stupid tackle over here, um, it'll get under your skin. As a pulling guard, it would get under my skin, because he couldn't have done that if I didn't do what I do. So it's an egotistical thing. Well, that guy's not done anything to earn that, but neither has Loki. And few things threaten the existence of an ego in a person worse than seeing a bigger ego in somebody else. I promise you, because I deal with it all the time in myself. <coughs> he went to Fenselir to Frigg and made himself into the likeness of a woman. I always point out, instead of facing it head on, he changes the very aspect of who he is to try to pretend to be something he's not to deal with this much larger ego than his. Then Frey asked if that woman knew what the Aesir did to the thing. She said that they were all shooting at Balder, and moreover that he took no hurt. Then said Frey, neither weapons nor trees may hurt Balder. I have taken oaths of them all. Then the woman said, have all things taken oaths to spare Balder? And Frey answered, there grows a tree sprout alone westward of Valhalla. It is called mistletoe. And I thought it too young to ask the oath. Then straightway the woman turned away, but Loki took mistletoe and pulled it up and went to the thing. Hoder stood outside the ring of men because he was blind. And this I've always thought of as Loki as an aspect of the Pope. Approaching the, the blind and the downtrodden, the outcast, those people standing at the fringe of society um, to preach this message of hope and point out the failures of the civilization that they were outcast from. But he said, then he spake to Loki, why dost thou not shoot at Balder? He answered, because I see not where Balder is, and for this also that I am weaponless. Then said Loki, do thou also after the manner of other men, and show Balder honor as other men do. So he suckered him into this, and he's made him believe it's the most worshipful thing. I will direct thee where he stands, and shoot at him with this wand. Hoder took the mistletoe and shot at Balder. Being guided by Loki, the shaft flew through Balder, and he fell dead to the earth. And that was the greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men. But is it? And we're told that it is. <clears throat> but I have another idea about that. Then when Balder was fallen, words failed all. The Aesir in their hands likewise to lay hold of him. Each looked at the other, and all were of one mind as to him who had brought the work. But none might take vision, so great a sanctuary was that place. But when the Aesir tried to speak, then it befell first that weeping broke out, so that none might speak to the others with words concerning his grief. But Odin bore that misfortune by so much the worst, because he removed the challenges from Baldur's life. He set his son up for failure. He paved a path and, and his wife asked every prom, made everything promised not to hurt him. And he didn't become what he was supposed to become and he lost him. How many rich men's children have you seen take over the family company and run that fucker right into the ground? How many times have we seen someone born with a silver spoon in their mouth that rise to the top and never really measure up to the quality of men that their fathers and grandfathers were? They never had to struggle. 
They never had to embrace challenge. What must a father feel like when he removes from his son those challenges and watches his son falter and fail and stumble in life? And that anger usually shows up as disdain for his son. Why, you're a failure. Why, you removed every challenge from my life. Why shouldn't I be? There's a real interesting thing going on there. And we see the culmination of that process happening in the streets of America right now with Antifa and Black Lives Matter and many other organizations, <coughs> all of them clamoring for another free handout or some kind of justice that they perceived they were denied in their raising raised by fathers who gave them, well, even to get into college. That's not something everybody gets to do. And to throw it back in the face and say, well, you white men and you have done this and you boomers have done that. Hmm, who's not earning their seat at the table here? When you look at Carl Jung's ideas about archetypes. They appear as fractured elements in the subconscious of men. Each archetype rising to the surface as each man or person deals with whatever happens to be in front of them at the time. And so we have pantheons of gods. Each god represents an aspect of the best part of what this part of our persona could be, this archetype, this idea that we hold in our mind of strength, of love, of courage. They, they hang about in, as separate identities in our subconscious. For the Western civilization to succeed, the incorporation of the logos or the spirit of the individual to be fully incorporated or present in a man must become something that happens. This is the message of Buddha. This is the message of the Messiah. And I'm looking at Balder and I'm seeing the same thing happen. When the spirit inhabits a body, it recoils in horror at the evils of this world. The pain that we see, the harm that we do to the other. Look at the 20th century in itself as a snapshot of human evolution. The very best thinking we could come up with resulted in the deaths of hundreds of millions of individuals around the world in the name of political ideas that are a weak and shallow substitute for the full incorporation of a person's spirit into the shell to learn the lessons he's supposed to learn in life. And yet we continue to buy into it and substitute righteous indignation as if it might be a quality substitute for spiritual growth. I find that a very shallow thing, and I see it prevalent across the board of much of the pagan beliefs, the monotheistic beliefs, and political systems, and I see this great Ganunin gap of humanity existing here, waiting on fire and ice to create something. Balder leads the way with that. When Balder dies, he goes to hell. <coughs> And when the gods had come to themselves, Frigg spake and asked who there might be among the Aesir who would fain have for his own all her love and favor. Let him ride the road to hell and seek if he may find Balder and offer a hell a ransom if she will let Balder come home to Asgard once again to remove from her son's future the challenges he must endure. How many times have I seen a mother or a father watch their son languish in drug addiction or alcoholism at the edge of death on the fringes of society in very much pain and they're standing there with gritted teeth and clenched fists saying, come on son, I know you can do it. And their son falls and their daughter falls and they end up in places that some of us only ever see in movies and some of us have lived through. And once again, Frigga is trying to do her best to make sure her son doesn't have to go through this. But those people that go through those rooms and then they come out of it and they find some kind of way to stand up one more time, they become, if they remain sober, the kind of quality people you want to associate with that make it easy to love, that find it easy to love you. Because they embraced the suck. Because they found a way to put themselves back up and find some kind of 
faith or spirituality, or I don't give a fuck if it's yoga, as long as they figured some way to figure out how to love themselves one more time and not have to live that way. They dealt with the challenges that they're at hand. They handled the pain of their life and became something more. As every God in the lore has done with the exception of Balder up to now. <coughs> the Aesir took the body of Balder and brought it to the sea. Once again, that great fathomless ocean of spirituality that the gods feast in at Eager's Feast. Tringhorny is the name of Baldur's ship, and it was the greatest of all ships. The gods would have launched it and made Baldur's pyre thereon, but the ship stirred not forward. And word was sent to Jotunheim after that giantess who was called Hurricane. And when she had come riding a wolf and having a viper for a bridle, then she leaped off the steed and old called to four berserks to tend the steed, but they were not able to hold it until they had felled it. Then Hurricane went to the prow of the boat and thrust it out at the first push so that fire burst from the rollers and all lands trembled. Thor became angry and clutched his hammer and would have straightaway broken her head had not the gods prayed peace for her. And then was the body of Balder borne out on shipboard when his wife Nana, the daughter of Nep, saw that straightaway her heart burst with grief. And she died. She was born to the pyre and the fire was kindled. And that's the first hint that something very special is happening here this feminine and masculine union of a full, powerful individual, a couple taking a journey together. There's something very powerful because he must have done something right. At some point, he must have been brave enough to love a woman that strongly. And many times, the feminine or with a female legend, the masculine can represent that divine incorporation of, of, of divine ideas with the spirit into the individual. <coughs> it can be perceived that way here as well. Then Thor stood by and hallowed the pyre with Mjolnir, and before his feet ran a certain dwarf, which was named Leiter. Thor kicked at him with his foot and thrust him into the fire. So, you know, keep your kids under control. I mean, if they're going to start showing their ass, they're going to get kicked into the fire. I mean, it's just the way it is. You've seen and not heard. I grew up that way. <laughs> People of many races visited this burning. First is to be told of Odin, how Frigg and the Valkyrs went with him and his ravens. But Frey drove in on his chariot with the boar called Goldmane or Fearful Tusk. And Heimdallr rode the, rode the horse called Goldtop and Freya drove her cats. Thither came also much people of the Rime Giants and the Hill Giants. And Loden, Odin laid on the pyre that gold ring which is called a drought near. This quality attended it, that every ninth night there dropped from it eight gold rings of equal weight. Baldur's horse led to the balefire with all of his trappings. And this is Odin doing his thing. So if you're a chieftain and you can give out eight gold rings of equal weight, eight oathed armbands every night, you can build for yourself one hell of a big army. <coughs> so he's setting his son up for success. This is just like a father giving his, his son the company. He's removing from him the challenge of proving himself to be that worthy leader. Once again, love blinds us sometimes, doesn't it? Now this is to be told concerning her martyr that he rode nine nights through the dark dales and deep so that he saw not before he was come to the river Giol and rode over the Giol Bridge which bridge is thatched with glittering gold. Could be the Milky Way for all we know. Our ancestors were very much star watchers. They built, there's rock formations and great monuments all over Europe that align with solstitial and celestial and lunar mo moments in time. Who's to say that this thatched bridge covered in gold wasn't the Milky Way? I mean, from the Mississippi and Indians to the Nile, a river with a sparkling river of light and stars above it has long been the pathway of life and death. Who's to say it's not the same thing here? <coughs> she asked him his name and race, saying that the day before they had ridden over the bridge five companies of dead men, but the bridge thunders no less under thee alone, and thou hast not the color of dead men. He doesn't belong. He's not supposed to be there. Why ridest thou hither on Hellway? He answered, I am appointed to ride to hell to seek out Balder. Hast thou perchance seen Balder on Hellway? 
She said that Baldur had ridden over there over the Gills Bridge, but down in north lieth Hellway. Then Hermod rode on till he came to Hellgate. He dismounted from his steed and made his girths fast, mounted and pricked him with his spurs, and the steed leaped so hard over the grate that he came no wise near to it. Then Hermod rode home to the hall and dismounted from his steed. Rode home to the hall is an interesting choice of words for someone that's not supposed to be there. It's also a glimmer of what we might expect, perhaps, if we cross that bridge. Are we to ride home to the halls of our ancestors? I'd like to believe that. He went into the hall and saw sitting there in the high seat, Balder, his brother, sitting there in the high seat. I don't know how many of the formal ceremonies you've ever been to, but sitting in the high seat is no accident. <coughs> There's much discussion and much debate about who gets it, and when you finally get it, it is quite the honor. Hermod tarried there overnight. At morn, Hermod prayed Hel that Balder might ride home with him and told her how great weeping was among the Aesir. But Hel said that in this wise it should be put to the test whether Balder were so all beloved as he had been said. If all things in the world quick and dead weep for him, then shall he go back to the Aesir. But he shall remain with Hel if any gainsay it or will not weep. That's quite a bargain if you think about who Hel truly is. This is a goddess who has access to all of the knowledge of every individual that has passed over all of the nine realms. So as a guardian of such knowledge and wisdom and ancestral lore as that has access to all of it, she's got this individual here under her tutelage, under her wing, sitting in the high seat. She, he is a valued guest to this goddess, this sun-facing woman that stands at the entrance of the burial. She's loving him. I mean, there's really no other way to look at it. Not as a partner, but as one of her own. <coughs> She's got plans for him. Because he has a journey of his own to make. One where he will not be able to call on mama and daddy to get out of the difficulties he has to face in life. And that's something we all got to understand some point in our life, we're going to come up in a situation where we can't call on mama or daddy. And we might not be able to hit our knees and call on some foreign God. And we're going to have to dig deep and figure out the gifts we were given to deal with the task at hand to become who we're supposed to become. He is going to fully incorporate the spirit of who he is into his frame. Now, this goes on, there's one being that will not weep, and he stays there. So of all the gods who had to go through a challenge to become what they're supposed to become, to grow into someone that could justify their seat at the table, these fragments of ideas in our subconscious that rise to the occasion whenever we deal with difficulty, here is one being that tried to negate that, and now must face an even bigger challenge. His path is something entirely different than the rest of the fragments of deities that we have in our subconscious. His path is one of the complete incorporation of the spirit and idea of who he is into his body. And he will learn from this sun facing goddess. His path is much different. So how do we figure out that we can still raise a horn to Odin and Thor, and then take a look at Balder, who is supposed to return after Ragnarok, and raise a horn to him as well. So just as every other god goes to their challenge to justify their seat at the table, Balder creates his own path. And I don't know if any of you have ever had to deal with a truly difficult situation in life. The loss of someone you love, the loss of a partner through divorce, the loss of a parent, drug addiction, alcoholism, any kind of the eating disorders, serious depression, the list goes on and on of the things that we recoil from in this world because we don't want to fucking deal with it. It hurts. I don't want to deal, I'm going to drink to cover that up. There's all kinds of things in this world we just don't feel like we're capable of handling. 
Where did we find the strength to put one foot in front of the other to handle that? Well, in this lore, we're always told we are born with the gifts to handle that. But sometimes that might not be enough. Let's say your entire village has been wiped out. Let's say your house is burnt down and you've lost every member of your family except for yourself. How are you going to deal with that? Do you think you will have the resolve and the will to stand up and handle such a tragic occurrence in your world? See, we all go through what we perceive as dark times. And by most accounts, this idea, other than people that have subscribed to the idea of hell as this goddess that is a guardian of all the wisdom and is the sun facing goddess at the entry of the burial mound uh, that escorts people to the halls of their ancestors, this loving and kind goddess of rebirth and regeneration and all the various forms that she takes, well, he might kind of be perceived as being in a dark place by most people in heathenry who are not aware of such distinctions. He's in a dark place, isn't he? And he has to travel and create a new path. His return to a different world is much akin to our return from the dark times we go through in our life. When we travel through this path and we're not really sure what we're relying on, but we're putting one foot in front of the other and we're doing our fucking best. It's like when I first got sober, I began to look at the world through a new set of glasses. It was very much a new world. I began to see the sunset again. I began to hear the river flow. I began to see the light in my children's eyes. I began to see wonderful new things. Now, I didn't have a field that bore ripened fruit or a field full of leeks. <laughs> I didn't have things producing unsound, but I did find that if I was doing the right thing, things got a lot easier. If I wasn't lying through my teeth about something, if I wasn't stealing from people, if I wasn't acting an ass, things began to go a lot better for me. I went through the tough times. I went through the dark times. I dealt with it. I almost died from it. And yet here I stand at 50. Balder is that image that I think much of heathenry has been lacking. What will I look like if I subscribe to this lifestyle? What will I become if I let go of these things that people have told me that I must believe? What happens if I separate myself from these fragmented archetypes of my subconscious and begin to truly embrace the idea of the world that I live in and perhaps even become a part of the environment? We're completely separate from that now. We have, not, we have no need to struggle to feed ourselves. We can go to the grocery store and the, and the shelves are groaning with food, even in this time of a pandemic and food shortages and toilet paper outages, nobody went hungry. And what are we doing with this luxury of kings? At that time, they were luxury of kings. What are we doing with that time? Are we using it to develop a higher thought? Are we using it to become more noble in our actions, more loving to our partners, more loving to the people around us with a half a loaf and a half a cup, a friend full fast I made? That compassion and generosity does not come from downtrodden, beat down individuals. That comes from the confident man who has made an effort to become who he's supposed to become. That kind of effort and a half a loaf and a half a cup and a friend full fast I made, that changes the world. And Balder is our example of that. You cannot avoid the pain of growing in this world. I don't care how much money you have. At some point, you're going to face it. At some point, the money's going to dry. When money flies out the window, love walks out the door. It's funny how that works, but my granny said it, and she ain't wrong. <coughs> There's going to be trying times in our life. And I suspect that if we're going to begin to tell people that this also true way of life has some kind of glimmer of hope in it, maybe we need to start grabbing a hold of the challenges of life instead of finding a way to blame a political ideology or find a group of people that are holding us down or becoming a victim and we just didn't know it. 
instead of substituting the righteous indignation of the shallow ideas of political thought that dominate the landscape of much of Austria today, maybe we need to start saying, hey, if you deal with that, you come out the other side, you'll be able to stand up like a man or the woman that you were born on this earth to become. Because that, my friends, is the opiate of the masses. That is hope. And I do not see that being offered today. And I see Balder making an effort to deal with it. Born with a golden spoon in his mouth. When her mother leaves, Balder led him out of the hall and took the ring Draupnir and sent it to Odin for remembrance. He handed back the opportunity his father gave him, said, no, this is the challenge. I'm going to become a man. And the idea of becoming a man is real simple. It's the first act, thought, that you do that removes you from the safety net of mother's love simply because you were born and take a risk to go become what you're supposed to become. Balder just did it when he sent that ring back. No, I'm going to build my own way. I will find my own path. I will be the man I'm supposed to be outside of the safety net of just being born, which is how he had operated for most of his life. And they called it a worshipful thing that he avoided growth. Now he's going to do it and, and just knock it out of the fucking park. And Nana sent Frigg a linen smock. Every young adventurer who left the home at first always wore the linen smock made by his mother as his first garment to venture forth into the world. And his wife sending that back to his mother is a sign that there's a complete incorporation of man and woman in this union that they're going to move forward together. And yet more gifts. And to Fula, a golden finger ring. Now, if you're a younger sister and your big sister disappears with someone and they're gone and they're away and she no longer has, she's kind of on her own and there's all kinds of uncertainty for every young woman. Can I be a mother? Can I bear a child? Can I be a good wife? Fuller gets this, Nana sends full of this little finger ring as a promise, as a hope, as you can do it too, little sister. I find a great deal of beauty and strength in that. I find a great deal of encouragement in those simple actions of a man and a woman becoming together to go forward and become what they're supposed to become. This is not an easy task. We see it fail about us across the board. What is it, 50 or 60%, 70% divorce rate? Who knows how many relationships had to be shattered and destroyed before even that union of marriage was accomplished. We cannot shy away from the responsibilities we have to begin to love ourselves first and accept the responsibility for our actions and become what we're supposed to become. Sometimes it's gonna piss people off. Not much you can do about it. But you will move forward and you will learn. When Balder completes his journey through Helheim with this great guardian and goddess that guides him through it all, he returns to a world that's suited for him and perhaps if we begin to pay attention to some of the deeper meanings of these tales, perhaps we might begin to build for ourselves a world we're suited to become what we're supposed to become. I can't tell you what that is for you. I have no idea. But I do know that we can no longer afford to, to sidestep the ideas of personal growth and development or the wisdom of these ancestors because we are more favorably inclined to becoming righteously indignant about political ideas? No, that's no longer going to work. Or this thing right here that we all hold so dear will die in the backyards as we pass away, having been another brief blip in a timeline of history. It's time to begin to reach for something more. And everything I just read there tells me it's probably going to suck. But it's time to do it. It's time to set aside those things that we have held to believe are so valuable and important because someone else said they were valuable and important. How does that help me put food on the table? 
how does that help me love someone stronger? How does that help me value me first and foremost? I have not accepted any great challenge. Can we say that about ourselves? What great challenge have you embraced? What great thing have you gone and tried to do? Because we can no longer afford to sit here and type on our keyboards on social media and call that a great and good thing and make it, th make it seem, well, this is worthwhile. Go do something big. Make it suck and see what you become. And pay attention to what's going on here with this Lord. Incorporate the spirit of who you are into your body. Fully appreciate what's going on. Yes, it, it might hurt. Don't shy away from it. Don't hide from it. Deal with it. Be in this moment. Feel that pain. Feel that love. I don't care. Sit there and cry, scream, kick, wail, whatever you think you need to do. But be in this moment with it. Don't avoid it. Don't deny it. Don't blame somebody else. Be you, not them. Anyway, I'm probably going to write a book about it. <laughs> anyway, anybody got any questions? Please don't talk about the ra the random penises earlier. That was don't talk about that. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to discuss them. And there are some pretty. Um, you also have access to Valerie right here tonight. And I got to tell you, man, if there's somebody that knows this shit, she's got some really interesting, interesting insights. Don't be shy. Because tomorrow's Monday. We ain't got to do a damn thing but lay on our ass. It's Labor Day. <laughs> I mean, it's holiday. <laughs> okay. If that not, was really cool, to... Brian. I'm really you glad like you that write a book on that. I do. I think writing a book on that right now is awful. It's awfully timely. <laughs> like, I think those are things that people really need to hear. So I, I don't know if they need to hear them, but they're going to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's both. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean, um, we got to start looking at that. I mean, there's a, we got a lot of, I mean, we've been doing this for 50 years, 60 years, something like that now. And this, um, if someone walks in and decides they want to become also true, what do I tell them about what their life might look like if they begin to embrace what it really means to live a life? Because honestly, if you're living a, a life the way we should be, we're living like five to one of everybody else. You know, I mean, there's always something going on. There's always something to do. There's always work to be done. There's always something to be reading or studying or learning or doing it's, or, or training or lifting. I mean, there's, it's a big life to live. And, I, and I, think, I think that's the real enemy. I think that's the real seductive power of comfort is when we become comfortable and we get familiar with certain things, what's the impetus to keep trying? Well, if you, if you live this lifestyle long enough, it just becomes a part of who you are. There's, you, just, you just do, you just keep going and life is good because of it, no matter what's going on. I mean, if it's a bad things happen in this time frame, I still feel pretty good. Things are still happening the way they're supposed to happen. I like it. Hey, Brian. I think I do actually have a question. Okay. What you got? You always have a good yeah. question. Jerry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think it's super pertinent to today's specific topic, but I, I kind of had this thought last night, and um, I'm just wondering what anyone really here thinks of it. So I'll just read. I posted about this on MeWe a couple hours ago. I'll just quote myself. I had an insight on doing some reflection yesterday about uh, Bifrost, Rainbow Bridge, uh, in ancient Rome, the high priest's office was called Pontifex Maximus, a title stolen by the Bishop of Rome. Mm -hmm. But that name meant something like the greatest builder of bridges. Mm -hmm. The idea, is, of course, is that ritual, ritual builds a metaphysical bridge between the terrestrial and the celestial realms. In order for the rainbow to appear, rain falls first, something a bit like a libation. So basically, is the concept of Bifrost or Osbru in any way a mythological parallel to ritual itself? That's, that's, a, that's a couple of different things, really, that in my mind, anyway. Ritual is that formal setting that solidifies in an individual's mind 
what they're doing. Let me, let's say that I'm leading a bloat for 150 people, right? I'm going through the motions, I'm doing everything. There's a Valkyrie carrying the horn. I'm reciting certain things, I'm talking. What is the purpose of what I'm doing? I'm trying to keep everyone on the same sheet of music. I'm trying to keep everybody's thought process all focused on one thing, right? So when we do ceremony, we're formalizing a thought process to make a connection with the divine as we perceive it, to connect with the fractured elements of, our, of the archetypes in our subconscious, correct? That's kind of what we're talking about with regards to ceremony. Now, if you want to get into ceremony, I highly encourage you to take a look at what the Theodish have done, because you're not going to find people that have a greater understanding of what a ceremony or how to conduct it than those individuals. And they, so now, as far as the bee frost is concerned, that ties into your thought process. Let me see if I can find this here real quick. The rainbow bridge. And some people don't like that I do this, but I do it anyway, because I, I, I find a... I'll share it on the screen here. See if I can give me just one second. And I think as soon as you see it, it'll probably click. Let's see. Find a pretty one here. Oh, there we go. Uh, share the screen. So when I'm talking about sharing the thought process. And I'm talking, this is from the Hindu. These are the colored chakras of Kundalini Yoga. The colors of the rainbow, right? So when our thought process is in alignment with our being, are we not creating a bridge? Are we not aligning ourselves to a divine element? However, we may perceive that. I think Steve probably came up with this years ago, but I think I enjoy it. I think it, it lends itself in my mind to my ability to connect with those higher thought processes that are the hallmark of entry into Asgard or connection with the divine as I perceive it. Do you see what I'm saying, Terry? That does actually make perfect sense. I hadn't made that connection, but I've noticed there are a lot of things like this that are hinted at in our lore that are explained <laughs> Among, among Hindu lore. <laughs> there is that. And you know what? You, you, will find common, you will find common themes of high mythological thought literally around the globe. There's an eight-legged white horse um, for the dead in Korean mythology. And I think there's another place there's an eight-legged horse too. Um, so you will find, and that's, I think, the second book I've tried to write was a book called Ingu's Developing the God Seed. Ing being being, doing, seeing, the activities that make you a part of the world you live in, that incorporate you into the environment you are. That great, that participle, Ingu's, the God Seed, and making that connection to action. And that is a real important thing there, but that, I went through all of the religions, time and geography, and, and found certain thoughts that resonated as a truth for this curious condition of a human existence, of a soul being in possession of a body as we travel through this, this realm. So there's a, there's a I, I think it always behooves an individual to go ahead and look at those. Uh, I, I have found beautiful thought in the writings of Khalil Gibran. I have found interesting things in the writings of Mesoamerican cultures. Go ahead and let your mind wander across that spiritual landscape of the various mythologies and bring and take a look. Now, sometimes it can get carried away. Um, try to keep it as, as legitimate as you can. If you can tie it together, you can tie it together. But don't be bringing voodoo into your room practice because it ain't going to work. <laughs> 
And somebody like Valerie is going to fucking call you out on it. <laughs> Hang on, you're still muted. There you go, Valerie. If I can interject right there, I really like yes. what Terry had to say regarding ritual. Yes. Um, the word ritual uh, from the Latin uh, actually has a Sanskrit root, and it relates back to rita, which is the divine order of things. So if we were to apply the idea of ritual to Bilfrost, the actual bridge itself that connects the mid world with the upper world, then the correct order of things naturally falls into place in my line of thinking because it is our place to both travel from where we are to there and for them to travel from there to where we are. Likewise, you have Gyul, which is the bridge that goes into hell. And it's the same concept. It allows us to travel from one realm of existence or one realm or expression of being or consciousness to the next realm. So I really liked what Terry had to say, how he put those elements together. And as far as um, looking further afield, I have long um, advocated the use uh, and practice of getting outside of the Scandinavian box to search further afield. And you're absolutely right. You don't want to be looking at things like Vudan, but you want to definitely be looking at things like the Indo-European practices. Um, those are the places where we're going to find, and we do now, if you really look honestly at our lore, everything in our lore relates back to an Indo-European practice, principle, concept, or idea. Most notably, Baldur and his brother Hulder, they are the divine twins. Yeah, um, yeah. Baldur is the day. Hulder, his blindness, signifies that he is the night. Um, and the divine twins is a concept that dates back to ancient Indo-European times. And those divine twins are most often portrayed as healers, as protectors, as warriors. I personally believe Baldur's beauty is a sign of Germanic uh, warriorhood, um, just as our women were often portrayed as, as blonde and beautiful and, and stunning to, to look upon. Baldur too was a great warrior. There are more kennings for him as being a warrior an accomplished and skilled member of the Mandelbund than there is for him to be actually innocent and childlike. Yeah, Just you're saying. right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. He that that divine twin also has a, an element of it of the of the dual of a of an individual has a good and a bad side in each individual. In the Bible, it shows up as Cain sl slew Abel. Um, it's interesting that they took that element of the divine twins within each of us these these elements of who we are and made them opponents which i always thought was a real odd twist but i think it, it serves a purpose for their purpose you know what i mean but within each of us there are there are elements of who we are right and wrong um, but I don't think they does it really have to be right and wrong do we not say within our own vernacular as different as day and night? That's right. You know, I yeah. have, just as we all have, a daylight persona, something that is seen um, clearly to anybody who looks upon me. Likewise, myself and everyone else also has a nighttime or dark persona that we do yeah. not share, even with those who may be closest to us. It's true. So in that sense, you know, I don't think that the blindness uh, is uh, a negative attribute so much as it's a hidden attribute. A That's lot a of times point. in the lore, things that are considered black or dark are not taken on as being negative, which was a lot of the Christian influence that came right. much later, but something that was obfuscated, something that was more um meant for the shadows meant for the darkness and in that i don't see anything wrong you know is there anything wrong with the night when you compare it to the day no each of them have their key attributes and and key points of health and well-being my plants grow very very well in sunshine but when the moon rises and the earth grows cool 
then my plants also flourish and rest just like my own body. So That's I when need they take those divine twins. I need those divine twins in my life. I need that active warrior aspect and I also need that hidden occult aspect as well. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that, that's kind of what I was saying in that in the monotheistic tradition, they made one murder the other. And that's, uh, that's just, that right there is a hint, isn't it? You might not want to be fooling with it. <laughs> Anything else, guys? I mean. I, I think that, um, um, you know, there's something to be said too for if you try to, if you try to kill off the darker, the darker part of you, the, you know, your darker half, um, you're no longer a complete person. You're no longer a complete soul, you know? And, and so you're, you're not, you know, you're not really good to anybody. If you, it, it, it's almost like I was reading something about um, toxic positivity, that there's something, there's such a thing as toxic positivity where, you know, you, you run away from, you know your your sadness or your fear or your anger and you don't ever right here, yeah you've got yeah. to embrace it all you've got to have every bit of it to live right. right exactly and if you if you try to kill that part of you you know you're not truly you're not truly living because you're you're rejecting an equally valid part of your psyche of your personality of what makes you you um I like how this kind of came full circle. I really like this. <laughs> That's a very yeah, good nice. point, Aaron. I like that. That's a very good point. There's Thank a great you. book yes. about that called Thick Face, Black Heart. It's written by uh, uh, by uh, uh, Ching Ming Chu, I think is her name. But it's uh, it's based on Chinese philosophy. But it's uh, it's an excellent book about that exact topic. What was you going to say, Tia? Well, I just wanted to uh, thank Valerie um, and Shawnee for, for both those comments, because that's, that's something I've struggled with personally, just uh, not going through self-condemnation because I'm, I haven't reconciled the two, those two parts. Um, so that, hel that helps a lot. Tia, I got to tell you, Valerie has a website. She's got a WordPress. And um, Valerie, if you'll tell them what it is, I, I think I told you early on, if you want some guidance as far as a woman goes in, in your part of the path. Valerie is one of the most exceptional teachers that we that we literally have been blessed to have around. I honestly mean that. Thank you. I do remember you saying that. That's her. Thank you, Brian. You know, something else I'd like to add here, especially for the ladies, since we've brought this up. And uh, when we're talking about Hela, our, our, our divine goddess of the underworld, um, she is a revered mother symbol. Yes. And I think it most notable that she would place Baldur, who represents the day, who represents life and vitality, but also the ideal of Germanic warriorhood. She placed him at the high table next to her. Yeah. This was a very specific um, act on her part, not just placing him at the high table, the place of high honor, but bringing that light, that sense of defense and care into her darkest of realms. Oftentimes, I think we tend to look at um, the underworld because of Christianity as a place of remorse and darkness. But here, she was bringing to our ancestors into their sense of loss, that sense of space where they are no longer surrounded by their beloved, she was bringing that sense of light and that sense of strength and courage to fortify their souls. And what was the divine purpose or the ultimate outcome of that? Well, Ragnarok, you know, Woda knew that the end of the gods would be coming, that the Ragnarok means the, the twilight's reign, so that all this Tavaric power was coming to an end. So where else to best sequester the greatest and the brightest of all warriors, but in a place among the ancestors themselves who would guard and watch over him, and in turn, giving all of us hope. Because heathenry is about ancestor veneration, not necessarily God worship, but giving the ancestors hope who in turn would infuse our lives 
with the primalcy of hope as well. There's a beautiful connection there that goes both ways that I, that I probably, one of these days I might talk about it, that, that we, we sometimes gloss over with the ancestors. But I, I also think, you know, Odin sacrificed himself to himself to pick up the, the runes, that jeweled form of the knowledge of all the, of his ancestors. I wonder how long, I mean, Baldur's essentially doing the same thing. He's essentially going through this journey with her to sacrifice himself to himself. I don't know, there's a, there's a beautiful correlation there of, of, a father, of a son doing what his father had to do to become who he's supposed to become. I, 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 I need to elaborate on it. I got to collect my thoughts on it, but I find a lot of interesting, it just fascinates the fuck out of me. I didn't know the way to put it. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. And I think it's one of the things that we need to be talking about more um, because I know for myself, the people that I deal with, they call, they call because they're hurting and they got it. And they, and they, and they're wanting to figure out what aspect of themselves to empower so they can make it through another day. And sometimes it's quite bad. Sometimes it's very bad. And that's, there's something real important, but you're right. He, he is sequestered in the halls of the ancestors. And that's an important thing. Perhaps it's a gift for a gift. He got the runes from his ancestors. He gave him his son. That's the powerful exchange of gift. You know, another interesting aspect of that tale is um, the Gigiar folk who just like Frigga ask all things to um, pray for Baldur, Hela also set up that same condition. She said, you know, does really everybody miss him? Does really everybody? And it was Throlk, the Gigiar, the great giantess, who um, said, no, I will not cry for him. And I think that's notable because her name means thanks. Now, thanks is a really <laughs> powerful word for somebody who we basically demonized. So right. she didn't cry for Balder, so he was punished and tortured and cast away into prison. But her name means thanks. So I think, I like to think that when our ancestors are writing these stories, they were living these little, little kernels of wisdom Absolutely. And when you have this powerful Yotanic woman, this Gigyar, she had the power to release more so than hell. She had the power to release Balder from that confine, but she chose not to. Was this out of spite or was it because she too was far seeing? Her name does mean thanks. And what is thanks but a gift for a gift, as, as Brian, you said earlier. So yeah. I'd kind of like to think that that was also a very deliberate act, not a punishment act, but something that she thankfully thought of and realized the importance of. There's always, that also, oh, sorry. Well, there's always a grandma or grandpa saying that boy needs to go through this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, well, their names don't always mean thanks. No, they don't. You're absolutely right. <laughs> what is that, that Aaron? What are you saying? Th that could also be kind of the same with, you know, having gratitude for the journey you're on instead of trying to backpedal and get out of whatever situation you're in. Beautiful. Um, but... Having gratitude for the journey that you're on and in, in, in um, ahead of time, being grateful for the lesson that you're about to learn. I think it makes it a lot easier to face it could, you know, it can take the, take the fear and uncertainty away when you approach this unseen, you know, challenge with gratitude, you know, thank you for whatever this is. I'm, I thank you for the evolution of me. Thank you for this journey. Thank you for this pain. I know I'm going to grow from it. Um, change your mindset entirely. Absolutely. That's nice. Yeah. Valerie, one we more need to thing. start looking at this female wisdom because it's often overlooked by all the testosterone in the room. Yep, <laughs> sure is. <laughs> what is Hurmod? Hurmod? What is that? Yeah, Hurmod. Say it again. Hurmod. 
Um, Hermod's name means. Um, no, no, no. What is uh, Hewer Mott? This thing you write about. Oh, Hoyer Mut. Hoyer Mut okay. means high mindedness. Um, this is a right. wonderful, yeah, high mindedness. This was actually the Germanic concept. Um, the, the nine noble virtues as we know them today was actually um, penned during the 1970s yeah. by um, modern auditors and really has no foundation in Germanic lore. A wonderful book that highlights Hoyermut is uh, Honor in German Literature by Dr. George Jones. Uh, it's a yeah. classic text worth looking into. Hoyermut, uh, some of these high-minded attributes uh, do correspond with the nine noble virtues, but the majority of them also include elements that we often skirt around. And I think that it would um, help us all, particularly as heathens, to um, embrace some of the concepts of Hoyermut, high-mindedness. The actual phrase high-mindedness is repeated, I do believe, 23 times in Havamal. So this was not an alien concept or not something that was, you know, simply created by Dr. George Jones. Yes, there it, there it is right there. But an actual um, concept that Woden himself was trying to convey to us via Havamal. And you are still writing a book about the Havamal, right? I am, that's correct. I'm still working on my translation and commentary of Havamal, yes. Man, I applaud you for that because it's just too damn big for me to even look at. <laughs> it, it is quite large. It is, uh, there, there's a lot of verses and stanzas and um, there's actually, it, very few people understand that Havamal is not a singular text. There's actually right. anywhere from three to six different books or chapters yeah. Yeah. inside that comprise the whole and weaving them all together is um, something that's really imperative for modern day heathenry. It is important. I think uh, the, I read, I read the uh, introduction to uh, a version of it last week. I'm going to read it again because you bring up a good, because it's important. It is, um, I don't know if you ever use this site, Valerie, but it's, it's, it's awesome. I'm not a big fan of the Bellows translation. When I first started doing my own translation and teaching myself Old Norse, um, I went through uh, Bellows and Alder and, and a lot of the uh, other, uh, both Victorian era and contemporary translators. And a lot of them were translating for their time. And as, yeah. as I oh, yeah. remarked earlier regarding women, a lot of them portrayed women in a very poor light. This one does. Uh, because if it was their society. So yeah. I quickly uh, uh, totally left out people like Bellows. Um, <laughs> some of the information they have is good, but you really have to counterbalance it with other translators who are more contemporary and who do not necessarily have a Victorian era or misogynistic mentality. We're giving away my secrets, man. We're giving away my secrets. Yeah. But it says here that there's five separate elements pretty clearly recognizable. Yes. Uh, one through 80, the collection of proverbs and counsels for the conduct of life. Uh, the two, the low fafness small stands as 111 through 138, uh, somewhat similar to first, but specifically addressed to a certain low The Yothatal, 147 to 165, a collection of charms, the love story of Odin and Billing, 96 through 102, and an introductory dissertation on the faithlessness of women in general, stanzas 81 through 95. That's your Victorian that you were talking about. It it's very misogynistic when you're translating it. Um, yeah. And we also too, and I talk about this in some of my commentaries, because I'm, I'm way past, uh, I'm actually finally have arrived at Runatal, um, but the, the admonitions against women is more woden being stung by a woman uh, than <laughs> anything else. This is this is more his commentary regarding his own personal uh, relationships than as directed towards women in general. And and that, I kind of point that out in my commentary. That is that is an important thing to notice because he is he does talk about um, missing. Uh, 
Gunlaw. He does talk about, you know, this poignant he kind was of expression. scorned. He was scorned and he took it badly. But then again, I, too, I often have a tendency to, to look at Woden as a petulant child. Uh, if you've read my book, Volaspa, Say There Is Weird Consciousness, you know, the Volva there constantly admonishes him. You yeah, know, she does. When she's asking him, would you know more than what? She keeps asking him, you give up your eye, you give up this, you give up that, yet still you're deaf, dumb, and blind. Would That's you true. know more? So, so he was constantly struggling with his own realization and his own self-awareness. So, yeah, I think he had some serious issues with women that, but at the same time, I don't think that we can look at that as just simply a snapshot and judge him for that. Because well, like we all, we grow, you know, uh, the, the way I was in relationships in my 20s was different from when I was in my 40s and now is different now that I'm in my 60s. So I have no doubt that Woden too growed, especially since he went through the initiatory rites that he did where he transitioned from self, lowercase self, to self, higher case self. He transitioned from ordinary mind to higher mood to a higher minded sense of consciousness and well-being. It's, it's no accident that it is the burning of um, God damn it! What's her name? Goldberg. Goldberg. The burning of Goldberg that leads to the loss of his kingdom. That leads to him losing the war. That leads to him beginning his wandering, where he eventually sacrifices himself to himself to come back and become what he, and take over what he's supposed to take over that golden age it was a dishonorable deed he broke a trust he broke the rule the the, the divine rule of host and guest so well, so i see that but i also see another thing too i also see that her as one of the all three all powerful female jotuns that entered the golden age of asgard that spread about um a love of gold the bewitching of men's mind and the horse thief the the theft of teamwork amongst a golden age of a kingdom. So there's there's a couple of layers to that as well. The love I mean, of always, gold. Is that just the physical gold or could that be the irresistible? I think that's I think that's I think that's envy. I think that's I think that's I think that's the the worst aspects of the Kardashians. You know what I mean? The the <laughs> love of gold and what men will do for the love of gold. Um, well, she was sent as an emissary, which means that she was considered the highest among her kind. So well, I can see that there is that aspect. So too. once again, the history here is written by those who destroyed her. So they naturally <laughs> would want to defame her name versus once again, she was sent as an emissary. She they they were saying she is our best and our brightest. So yeah, here, but I mean I, I mean I don't I don't know that I'll intuitively. Intuitively, I know I'm not as well versed of, as, in this stuff as you guys are, but intuitively from the moment I started my journey on, you know, in, into heathenism um, or heathenry, I always have felt that that, that phrase, the, the love of gold was, was widely misinterpreted. Um, I've just always felt that she, again, just intuitively, and I can't ever really put my put my finger on why specifically but and I've spent a lot of time really questioning this and still haven't come up with any real good oh, answer but I need to question. read my book Voluspa Say There Is Weird Consciousness because I break down the meaning of her name and what gold actually represented to the ancient peoples from a cultural perspective not from our perspective today but from how they viewed gold which you are correct in your innate assumption is not a negative way at all. Yeah, I always feel that she's she's just gotten kind of a bad rap, and and again, not because she was a woman, to, right? Well, I was just going to say not to poop on <laughs> a all man will burn party. a woman down. Don't kid yourself. Not to poop on everyone, all the guys party in here, but you know, men fear powerful women, especially, sure. you know, especially you know if she had more, um, you know influence or she had you know stronger skill set you know and and i mean it's it's odin you know he's he's a prideful he's a, he's a prideful god he's a prideful man you know um look at look at you know a lot of um 
you know, the, the things that women were put through during the Inquisition, you know, um, or, or if you, you know, look at, at Salem, for example, I have an ancestor actually that was, that was killed in, in Salem. Um, a lot of these women, you know, they were in powerful positions because of who they were married to. And you had these men, you know, that, that were afraid of, of the influence that they could potentially wield and what better way to shut them up than to kill them. You know? so even, even within our own heathenry, and this is quite notable, that all of our vulvas and all of our folk who do say they're, are described once again in these older texts as witches. The word mm. witch is never found in Old Norse. The word most commonly given to some to a woman who practices Seder, who is a vulva, is fiokining, which is much knowing. It is a word that I often use in all of my texts, and I use it frequently in my writing, because this is the number one word, the number one expression, how they understood these women. They were much knowing. They were not witches. Oh they were not hags. They were wise women, and they knew much. And the word know to them was more of a, a skill. It wasn't something like, oh, I know how to cook. This was somebody who was more like a chef, somebody who actually studied and knew. They knew healing. They knew foreign threifa. Right. They knew star she's, watching. They knew stargazing. They knew, they knew the food. They knew all the she's laws right. and the orlogs and the ritas. They knew this information. They were much knowing. And this is why they were brought into these villages to, to sit at the high table and to give wise counsel because they were much knowing. The She's word witch didn't even come along until the Christian Protestant Reformation in the 1600s. So it was something that was absolutely created by the church. This was not a concept or an ideal that was embraced by the ancient heathens. So yeah. when you say, um, you said, um, um, love of gold you said it was it a gold a gold like aura or a golden way of being um yes that could have been very attractive you know to to the to the other gods to the other beings you know taking kind of the the um all-knowingness sort of away from odin you know um kind of redirecting the focus away from him i i just i i know we're kind of getting off topic here i just like I oh, said, there's a it's, great debate to be had by all of it. I mean, there's, no, there's, Aaron, I think you should continue following that that line of mental pursuit and following your heart as far as that's concerned, and really start looking at the lore more deeply for those strong feminine elements because they are there. We just need more, I think, female eyes looking in that direction. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I dated a guy a while back that he was absolutely 150 percent convinced that Galvig was the epitome of evil. Oh and that God. and that all evil stemmed from <laughs> from Galveg, that it of course it came from a woman and um Which obviously we we, we did it Christian perspective Christians oh yeah totally demonize uh, and drag women through the dirt and and I, it has no place in heathenry no heathen man in my opinion should think that way and if he does he is still uh, deeply rooted in his Christian upbringing. Oh, he's he's deeply rooted in a lot of things, and he's not my boyfriend anymore. But <laughs> good for you, get away from that. I ran real fast. <laughs> Valerie, Valerie, yes, this is sir. Gerda. You remember Gerda? I think I do. Yes. Hi there. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. I'm just trying okay. to be okay. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to see you. You too. Yeah, she's just, she's been visiting with us this weekend. Just Wonderful. Hanging out. Yeah, we had a little get, we had my, she came for the birthday party yesterday. Nice. <laughs> it is nice. It is nice to have a community around you. Hey, yes, listen, just, just to uh, jump back in the conversation for a minute, you pulled up Honor and German Lit on uh, Amazon and the prices, yes. it was kind of pricey on Amazon. Yes, I have a PDF is. version if anybody wants it, I can just send it, it to me. I want it. Yeah, oh, the sure. PDF is out there. Thank you, Everett, for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah send that to is... me if you would. Me too, if you don't mind, bud. Well, me three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who was two? Me, Aaron. Aaron. 
Okay. I've actually written, I've written a several essays. Actually, I've written a primary essay on um, uh, Hoyer Moot. And what I did, I just simply extrapolated all the concepts of high mindedness that Dr. Jones uh, uh, contabulated himself. And I put them into a singular essay. So it makes it a lot easier to read. You can read the whole book. I highly recommend reading the whole book. But um, I, I, once again, I just simply extrapolated the Hoyer moot. And then I even have a comparison side by side with the nine noble virtues for us to really, as heathens, to break it down in our own mind and our own understanding and see how we can best apply it to both ourselves and to our community at large. Will you, will you email that to me? Will you send that I to sure me? Can. I can. Do Thank that. you very much. I'd love to read it. I'd love, really yeah, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Oh, I will share that. Okay, guys, I really appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you all for joining me. As always, it's a, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure to sit here and be able to discuss these kind of things. Aaron, be sure to drop me a line. I would love to hear some more of your ideas and thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Terry, I think Terry hung up, but I also like nice some of the there. things that Terry had to say as well. Yeah, what's your website again? Who, mine? Yeah, yours. Which one? Oh, well, it's easier to find me through my Facebook page, which oh, I know you don't guys. like anymore. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a wealth of information there that is just it's really important. And she's got several books on Amazon too. They're all very good. I've got a yeah, couple. All my books are on Amazon. Correct. I think I have Cedar Spray in that here. I found it. I was looking through it the other day. Anyway, I appreciate everybody's time this evening. All of y'all have a good night. Tomorrow's Labor okay. Day, a communist holiday. Feel free to lay on your ass <laughs> and have a day. good day off. Good night. Right. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you all very much. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.